Good afternoon, and welcome to the second quarter 2020 Hewlett Packard Enterprise Earnings Conference Call. My name is Eileen, and I'll be your conference moderator for today's call. At this time, all participants will be in listen-only mode. We will be facilitating a question and answer session towards the end of the conference. Should you need assistance during the call, please signal a conference specialist by pressing the star key followed by zero. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded for replay purposes. I would now like to turn the presentation over to your host for today's call, Ms. Sona Lee Parikh, Senior Vice President of Corporate Development and Investor Relations. Please proceed. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. This is Sona Lee Parekh, SVP of Corporate Development and Investor Relations for Hewlett Packard Enterprise. I would like to welcome you to our fiscal 2020 second quarter earnings conference call with Antonio Neri, HPE's President and Chief Executive Officer, and Tarek Robiati, HPE's Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer. Before handing the call over to Antonio, let me remind you that this call is being webcast. A replay of the webcast will be made available shortly after the call for approximately one year. We posted the press release and the slide presentation accompanying today's earnings release on our HPE Investor Relations webpage at investors.hpe.com. As always, elements of this presentation are forward-looking and are based on our best view of the world and our businesses as we see them today. For more detailed information, please see the disclaimers on the earnings materials relating to forward-looking statements that involve risks, uncertainties, and assumptions. For a discussion of some of these risks, uncertainties, and assumptions, please refer to HPE's filings with the SEC, including its most recent Form 10-K. HPE assumes no obligation and does not intend to update any such forward-looking statements. We also note that the financial information discussed on this call reflects estimates based on information available at this time and could differ materially from the amount ultimately reported in HPE's quarterly report on Form 10-Q, for the fiscal quarter ended April 30th, 2020. Also, for financial information that has been expressed on a non-GAAP basis, we have provided reconciliations to the comparable GAAP information on our website. Please refer to the tables and slide presentation accompanying today's earnings release on our website for details. Throughout this conference call, all revenue growth rates, unless noted otherwise, are presented on a year-over-year -year basis and adjusted to exclude the impact of currency. Finally, please note that after Antonio provides his high-level remarks, Tarek will be referencing the slides and our earnings presentation throughout his prepared remarks. As mentioned, the earnings presentation can be found posted to our website and is also embedded within the webcast player for this earnings call. With that, let me turn it over to Antonio. Thanks, Anali. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I hope everyone is safe and healthy. Pardon me, ladies and gentlemen, we seem to be experiencing some technical difficulties. Uh, Antonio, um, your line may be on mute. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, we ha I had a problem with my phone. So, uh, thanks, Anneli. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today, and I hope everyone is safe and healthy. Our fiscal Q2 results represent a full quarter of operating during the coronavirus-19 crisis. This pandemic is unlike any other crisis we faced and it has brought significant economic disruption. Businesses and communities are struggling. Supply chain productivity continues to be significantly constrained, and the demand environment is uneven. The market for capabilities like remote connectivity and virtual desktop solutions is stronger than pre-crisis in certain segments, and we are well positioned in those areas. But overall, customers are understandably cautious given so much uncertainty. These dynamics had a significant impact on our financial performance this quarter, given the economic lockdowns since February. Our overall Q2 revenue declined by 15% to $6 billion, which led to a 42% decline in our non-GAAP operating profit. This was a tough quarter by every measure, and I am, of course, disappointed in the results. But I do not view our Q2 performance as a reflection of our capabilities, nor of the opportunity ahead of us. 
Through this unsettling time, I have been really proud of our response that is aligned to our purpose to advance the way people live and work. We consider it our responsibility to help the world navigate this pandemic. We have prioritized protecting the health and safety of our team members and supporting our customers and partners as we weather this storm together. At the outset, we moved quickly to mobilize crisis management teams around the world. We took decisive steps to ensure our team members' safety and well-being. We closed all of our sites and rapidly moved team members to work from home, except for those that performing mission-critical roles. We expanded team members' benefits to cover coronavirus-19 testing and treatment, enhanced mental health support, and provided tools and resources to keep people connected and productive. We also responded with important initiatives to address key needs created by the pandemic. We made substantial donations through HPE's foundation and designated $2 billion in financing through HP Financial Services to help customers and partners with financial hardships. Our Aruba networking capabilities have been deployed in drive-up and virtual healthcare clinics and in schools that are facilitating distance learning. And our high-performance computing solutions are helping scientists at leading research institutions speed up drug recovery, discovery with complex modeling, simulation, AI, and machine learning capabilities. We join forces with the U.S. government and other high-tech companies to form the White House High Performance Computer Consortium, giving coronavirus-19 researchers access to HPC resources. HPE also signed the Open COVID Pledge, granting free access to all of our patent and technologies for the purpose of diagnosing, preventing, and treating the virus. We have also adapted to deliver much-needed capabilities and experiences to aid our customers' transformations as they navigate this difficult time. Through an improved sales coverage model aligned to market segments, our intelligent edge business continues to outperform the market while expanding operating margins and demonstrated 12% year-over-year growth in North America. In addition, we gained traction in our HP Green Lake business. We continue to see acceleration in this very profitable strategic business and are seeing larger deals come in, underscoring a growing interest in our other service offerings. In fact, our annualized revenue run rate, or ARR, increased 17% to $520 million. While these are healthy signs of the needs that customers will continue to have coming out of the crisis, there continue to be significant supply constraints and delays in customer acceptance. This has impacted our ability to make deliveries to our customers. Across our portfolio, we exited Q2 with more than $1.5 billion in backlog in compute, storage, HPC, and mission-critical systems, as well as Aruba which represents two times the historical backlog. Our team is doing everything we can to deliver on these, uh, uh, on these uh, customer orders. Tarek will take you through our Q2 results in more detail. But before he does that, I want to take the time to align actions we will take to address the near-term uncertainty and ensure HP is well positioned to emerge stronger, more agile, and digitally enabled for a post-coronavirus-19 world. While the world is starting to envision what a recovery might look like, we need to be prepared for different scenarios. We know there is no going back to what used to be. There is only preparing for and building what comes next. We need to adapt in order to keep our strategic momentum, even as the world has changed dramatically. We are taking a deliberate set of actions to protect our financial foundation, become a more agile organization, and align our resources to critical core businesses in areas of growth that accelerate our h to cloud platform as a service strategy. We continue to analyze financial forecasts and customer trends to better understand when and how global economies will recover. In the meantime, we are taking some immediate steps to reduce operating expenses that will protect our financial profile. Effective July 1st, we will implement a short-term pay reduction for all team members where it is legally permitted through October 31st, 2020. My executive team and I will take the highest percentage reduction. Beyond that, the amount of reduction will vary by level. For team members who live in countries where pay reductions cannot be mandatory due to local laws and regulations, 
we are implementing unpaid leaves. In addition, we have implemented cost containment measures across the company, restricted external hiring through the end of our fiscal year, and put salary increases on hold. Additionally, our board of directors have voluntarily decided to forego a percentage of its cash compensation for the remainder of the fiscal year 2020 to demonstrate its commitment to Hewlett Packard Enterprise as we focus on preserving liquidity and improve our position to deliver for our customers now and in the future. In addition to those short-term measures, today we are announcing a cost optimization and prioritization plan. This plan will help us focus our investments and realign our workforce to areas of growth that will accelerate our strategy. Some of the measures in the plan include continue to streamline our product portfolio, implementing new digital customer engagement models, and optimizing our workplace size strategy and experiences. HP expects the plan will be implemented through fiscal year 2022. And as a result of the changes to the company's workforce, real estate model, and for the business process improvements, we estimate gross savings of at least $1 billion and annualized net run rate savings of at least $800 million by fiscal year 22 year end. In order to achieve this level of cost savings, HPE estimates cash funding payments between $1 billion to $1.3 billion over the next three years. Tarek will provide further details in his remarks. While we take the steps to secure a financial foundation and strengthen our operations, we have simplified our operating model and have aligned it to the financial segmentation we introduced early this year. Each of the HPE's businesses is critical to our go-forward success. Each carries are an important part of the mission. And as our customers demand new and different products and services from us, we must deliver. I am personally committed to delivering to help each of our businesses leverage its existing strengths and evolve. Each of our business groups now report directly to me. As part of our new organizational model, we created a GreenLake Cloud Services Group to accelerate our other service capabilities. We also added a new software team that will architect our software strategy and portfolio that power our other service platform. This new structure will provide further accountability and improve our execution and transformation. As the world emerges from the global pandemic, business continuity will depend on solutions that advance IT resiliency, empower remote workforces securely, extend connectivity, reinvigorate customer engagement, and enable business model evolution. These realities means that the digital transformation will be more critical than ever. This is why we must accelerate our strategy to deliver everything as a service edge to cloud. We see data growth in the cloud, on and off-premises, and increasingly at the edge where we are uniquely positioned. At the edge, customers need persistent connectivity to bridge the digital and physical worlds. HP Aruba Central is at the core of our edge strategy. It is the only cloud-native, simple-to-use, and secure platform that unifies network management for wire, wireless, and one networks, and soon 5G and edge computing. In Q2, the number of unique customers using Aruba Central increased to 65,000. Customers will also continue to need capabilities that harness the power of their data, wherever it lives, at the edge, across public and private clouds, in co-locations, or in the traditional data center. We continue to believe the cloud is an experience, not a destination, and other service business models will extend the cloud experience everywhere for all apps and data. Early this month, we announced the general availability of HP GreenLake Central, our advanced cloud native platform that provides customers with a consistent cloud experience for all their application and data through an online operations consoles that runs, manages, and optimizes their entire hybrid cloud estate. And in Q2, we made HP Container Platform generally available. Our new cloud-native software-defined stack is built using technologies from HP's acquisition of Blue Data, Storage, and MapR, and deliver greater flexibility and lower cost for Kubernetes deployments of cloud-native and non-cloud-native applications with persistent storage connectivity. Next month, our at our first ever Discover virtual experience, we will showcase how HPE will help organizations ensure seamless business continuity through new technology capabilities, 
greater business intelligence, and enhanced financial flexibility. Joined by thousands of customers and partners, we will discuss how we should think differently about transformation in the future and will introduce new innovation to bring agility to customers' up and data, ups and data everywhere. There is a great promise in what we can accomplish when we increase the speed of innovation and continue to bring to market differentiated capabilities from edge to cloud. Our customers, partners, and communities need what HP can provide. Our ability to execute our strategic pivot to offering our entire portfolio as a service by 2022 while we continue to re-architect and strengthen our core businesses is critical. As we drive increased performance in our core businesses, we'll be able to further align resources to new growth segments that will accelerate our strategy and pave the way to sustainable, profitable growth. One of our core beliefs at HPE is the power of yes, we can, and I'm confident in our ability to execute because I believe we have the right strategy, the right leadership team, and the right mindset to adapt and deliver in bold new ways. We are focused and we are making the necessary trade-offs so we can continue to invest in the future. We are undertaking it with a sense of urgency and conviction in our strategy. With that, let me turn it to Tarek to review the quarter's results. Tarek? Thank you very much, Antonio. Hope you can all hear me and are all safe and well. I'll start with a summary of our financial results for the second quarter of fiscal year 2020. As I have done before, I'll be referencing the slides from our earnings presentation to highlight our performance in the quarter. Also, please note, since last quarter, we are now reporting results according to our new segmentation. Antonio discussed some of the key highlights of this quarter on slide one. Now, let me discuss our financial performance, starting slide two. Our Q2 results were heavily impacted by the global COVID-19 crisis. As Antonio mentioned, our Q2 represented a full quarter of operating under COVID-19. Our revenues of $6 billion were down 15% year over year, primarily driven by supply chain disruption which resulted in significantly higher levels of backlog, particularly in compute, HPC MCS, and storage. We also saw uneven demand with customers pushing out business activity as they navigated through the current economic crisis and lockdown. At the edge, the market for capabilities like remote cloud connectivity and virtual desktop solutions was stronger than pre-crisis in certain segments, and we were well positioned in those areas, offsetting the decline in camper switching that resulted from lower business activity. Despite the challenging backdrop, we managed to maintain relatively stable non-GAAP gross margins, which were down by 20 basis points year over year. Our non-GAAP operating profit, however, was down 42% year over year to 6.1% in operating margin terms, and in our non-GAAP EPS of $0.22 cents was down 48% year over year. Our GAAP EPS was a loss of $0.64, cents, primarily due to an $865 million non-cash goodwill impairment charge associated with legacy goodwill allocated to the HPC and MCS business segment, which impacted GAAP net EPS by $0.67. Cents. This impairment was not driven by the Cray business, which continues to perform consistent with our expectations. Cash flow from operations this quarter was $100 million, impacted by reduced profitability and inventory buildup. Free cash flow was negative $402 million, compared to a positive $402 million for the prior year period, which was impacted by higher financing volumes. Taking all the previous into account, we're taking decisive and prudent actions to manage our costs and expenses, further improve our liquidity, and focus on opportunities to emerge stronger in the post-COVID-19 world. Turning to slide three, Antonio outlined for you some of the near-term cost takeout measures we're implementing, including reductions in pay across our workforce 
unpaid leave in places where pay reductions are not legally permitted, and hiring restrictions. He also mentioned the actions we're committing to today to further strengthen our financial profile in the medium and long term and accelerate our strategy. Today, we are announcing a cost optimization and prioritization plan to reflect the current revenue environment and to position ourselves as a more resilient company ready to address the needs of our customers in a post-COVID-19 world. We remain confident that we have the right strategy and are taking the right actions to secure our financial foundation and support our path to sustainable, profitable growth. More specifically, our plan is designed to right-size our cost structure to the new normal, to allocate resources in alignment with our new segmentation and growth areas, to drive increased efficiencies through investment in digitalization and automation, and finally, to accelerate our pivot to as a service to drive long-term, sustainable, profitable growth. Overall, these new cost efficiencies will be captured from simplifying and evolving our product portfolio strategy and go-to-market, cost saving from supply chain optimization, increased penetration of remote customer support, new initiatives to leverage digital marketing and consolidating our real estate footprint. In terms of a timeline, we expect that the plan will be implemented through fiscal year 2022 and estimate that it will deliver annualized net run rate savings of at least $800 million by fiscal year 22 end. Having said that, we expect to achieve the majority of the savings by the end of fiscal year 21. In order to achieve this level of cost savings, we estimate cumulative cash funding payments of between $1 billion to $1.3 billion over the next three years. We'll now move to slide four that shows our performance in the quarter in accordance with our new segmentation. Let me hit a few key points. In the intelligent edge segment, we declined 2%. However, we saw over 12% year-over-year growth in North America, showing that the changes we made to our North America sales leadership and go-to-market segmentation are paying off, even in the midst of a challenging business environment. While campus switching declined single digits due to increased emphasis on working from home, we grew the wireless LAN product business 7% year-over-year due to high demand for our remote access solutions and Wi-Fi 6 certified access points with 35% year-over-year growth in North America. Furthermore, we expanded gross margins and also grew operating margins by 570 basis points year-over-year to 11%. The bottom line is that we gain share in both camper switching and wireless LAN markets while significantly improving profit margins. In compute, revenue declined 19% this quarter driven by lower conversion rates even as order backlog grew to two times our average historical backlog and lower unit growth which was negative double digits this quarter. Our ability to fulfill orders was impacted by component shortages with supply chain logistics further disrupting our ability to fulfill demand due to the coronavirus pandemic. As the supply chain constraints alleviate, we expect to execute against our high backlog. In high performance compute and mission critical systems, Revenue declined 18% primarily as a result of delayed installation and customer acceptance on account of COVID-19. Similar to compute, this resulted in an elevated backlog, but we expect to see a stronger uptick in revenues in the second half of the year as we execute against the order book. Our HPC business has been actively involved in COVID-related research activity and is provided providing COVID-19 researchers worldwide with access to the world's most powerful HPC resources to advance the pace of scientific discovery in the fight to stop the virus. Furthermore, we announced the 2023 delivery of the world's fastest exascale supercomputer, El Capitan, for the United States Department of Energy at a record-breaking speed of two exaflops, 10 times faster than today's most powerful supercomputer. Most importantly, the Cray integration remains on track 
to deliver the FY20 revenue targets and triple-digit run rate synergies by fiscal year 21. Within storage, we declined 16% year-over-year due to higher backlog similar to compute, but had notable strength in big data showing a growth of 61% year-over-year. Nimble services revenues grew 20% year-over-year with services intensity at record highs as customers at high margin value added services. For operational services, which is included across compute, HPC, MCS, and storage, revenue declined by less than 1% year over year, while orders were down 5% year over year, driven by the drop in compute units. On the positive side, our services intensity, which is the ratio of attached revenue per hardware unit sold, continued to be strong with double-digit growth in storage and HPC MCS services driven by Cray. This demonstrates that the underlying profitability of the units we sell and the attach rates continues to be robust. In advisory and professional services, revenue was down 8%, but we significantly improved operating margins by 6.2 points year over year due to our re-entry in select countries combined with an increase in remote delivery of projects from 65 to 90%, which helped to control costs and drive an improvement in chargeability levels of staff. Within HPE Financial Services, financing volume grew 10% year over year, despite the impact of COVID-19, and our net portfolio of assets was up 4% this quarter with longer contract terms supporting GreenLake. We maintained a solid return on equity of approximately 15% again this quarter. Our bad debt loss ratio this quarter was 0.5%, which is best in class in this industry. We will obviously continue to closely monitor the impairment losses as liquidity constraints could affect some of our customers' ability to pay in upcoming quarters. We will tighten our underwriting guidelines as necessary to ensure we can manage through this crisis and any impairment losses remain within our level of comfort. Our communications and media solutions business that is included in our corporate investment segment is a strategically important business to us, providing software and services capabilities to telco service providers. CMS is showing improved momentum. We saw strong double-digit software order growth with EMEA growing 45% and Japan growing 70% this quarter. Revenue gained momentum growing 2% sequentially. We also expanded operating margins by 170 basis points year over year this quarter. We also recorded our first 5G core win with a tier one carrier in the United States. The strategic win validates our 5G strategy with multi-vendor integration and true cloud native telco network solutions. Slide 5 shows our growing ARR profile I introduced at our securities analyst meeting in October 2019. I'm pleased to report that our Q220 ARR came in at $520 million, representing 17% year-over-year growth and in line with our expectations. Our HPE Aruba Central SaaS platform continued to grow revenue triple digits year-over-year this quarter. As we progress towards building our go-to-market as a service motion and remain focused on offering a full suite of differentiated solutions that can be consumed as a service, we are reiterating our ARR growth guidance of 30 to 40 percent compounded annual growth rate from FY19 to FY22. Slide 6 highlights our EPS performance to date. Non-GAAP diluted net earnings per share was $0.22 cents in Q2, with headwinds from a used operating leverage, suspension of our share buybacks, and a lower but expected contribution from OINE. Consistent with our guidance at SAM, we expect OINE to be approximately negative $100 million for fiscal year 20. Turning to gross margin on slide 7, we delivered non-GAAP gross margin of 32% in Q2 of fiscal year 20, which was down 20%, which was down, excuse me, 20 basis points year over year. Commodity costs were a tailwind to gross margin this quarter, 
even as the supply-demand balance turned into a more inflationary commodities environment at the start of the quarter. Moving to slide 8, non-GAAP operating margin was 6.1% in Q2 of fiscal year 20, and non-GAAP operating income was down 42% year over year. This clearly demonstrates the imperative to right-size our business to reflect the new revenue profile we are facing as a result of the COVID-19 impact. Turning to slide 9, our cash flow from operations was $100 million impacted by reduced profitability from the compute and storage businesses, which were heavily impacted this quarter and higher than normal working capital. Free cash flow was a use of $402 million for the quarter, driven by year-over-year growth, which was impacted by financing volumes. Higher than normal backlog and resulting inventory buildup triggered a reduction in our cash conversion cycle from minus 17 days in the prior quarter to minus 5 days this quarter. We expect our cash conversion cycle to improve through the rest of the year as we execute against the backlog and supply chain constraints alleviate both of which help us reduce our high inventory levels. Now, moving on to slide 10, I want to spend a moment on the strength of our balance sheet and investment grade credit rating, which is a competitive advantage in this environment. As of our April 30th quarter end, we had approximately $5.1 billion of cash and cash equivalents, having successfully raised $2.25 billion in senior notes in April 2020 at a low cost of capital. We also have an undrawn revolving credit facility of $4.75 billion at our disposal. So in total, we have approximately $10 billion of liquidity. We remain committed to maintaining our investment grade rating, which was reaffirmed by the rating agencies in April 2020. Bottom line, we have a strong cash position and ample credit available during these uncertain times to support and invest in our business. Let me recap for you our key takeaways for this quarter on slide 11. But before I do that, it's worth spending a couple of minutes on capital allocation. In Q2, we returned $305 million to shareholders in the form of share repurchases and dividends. We repurchased $151 million in shares and paid a cash dividend of $154 million. In April 2020, we took the decision to suspend share buybacks in the light of the current environment where liquidity is of paramount importance. Subsequently, in April, we announced a regular dividend payment for Q320 payable in July. Finally, let me summarize the key takeaway for you this quarter. Our fiscal Q2 results represent a full quarter of operating under the COVID-19 crisis and were heavily impacted by the crisis, both on the demand and supply side. As a result, we have enacted short-term actions and long-term cost optimization and prioritization plans to reflect the current revenue environment and to position ourselves as a more resilient company in a post-COVID world. Our robust balance sheet with approximately $10 billion of liquidity and investment-grade credit rating gives us flexibility not only to weather the current storm, but to continue to invest in key growth initiatives. We remain confident that we have the right strategy and are taking the right actions to secure our financial foundation and support our path to sustainable, profitable growth. Now, turning to outlook, since the crisis began, We've been stress testing our model and running scenarios based on various assumptions, just like everybody else does. Given the level of uncertainty around the duration of the crisis and the rate and the shape of the recovery, there's a wide range of possible outcomes for the year. We have taken prudent and decisive steps, with the latest being our cost optimization and prioritization plan, so that we are prepared for the different outcomes. Due to the uncertainty and consistent with our April 6, 2028 k filing, where we withdrew our fiscal year 20 financial guidance, we will not be providing any Q3 or fiscal year 20 guidance. Now, with that, 
let me hand over to Antonio and open it up for questions. Antonio? So, thank you, Tarek, and I know Nancy is going to moderate this, so Nancy, why we don't uh, get started. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star, then one on your touchtone phone. If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the key. To withdraw your question, please press star, then two. We also request that you only ask one question and one follow-up question. Our first question comes from Katie Huberty with Morgan Stanley. Thank you. Good afternoon. The color on backlog is helpful, but I wonder whether you could also give some color on how orders trended through the fiscal second quarter and what you've seen from an order perspective in the month of May. And then just related to that, you specifically said that the HPC uh, business and conversion rates would tick up in the second half, but you stopped short of giving a similar timeline for compute and storage. So just any color as to when you think orders will begin to convert in, in those two segments as well. Yeah, hi, Katie, and thanks for the question. Uh, so uh, the order intake, or what I refer to as the order linearity, was fairly steady, I have to say. Um, you know, um, you know, we normally plan a quarter in 13 weeks. The first week is the previous backlog from the previous quarter, uh, the backlog from the previous quarter, and then 12 weeks, right? Um, and we planned that linearity early on, and I will say we hit or exceeded our order linearity intake every every week of the quarter. Um, and so this really came down to our ability to convert the order book into revenue and um, and in the case of HPC, high performance computing, uh, let me remind uh, everyone that in order for us to convert that uh, order into revenue, we have to build it, obviously, we have to ship it, but we have to install it and we have to turn it on. And once the customer accepts that, you know, installation, which in many cases is fairly large installations, you're talking about a number of clusters, that's when only we can recognize revenue. And so the impact on HPC was twofold, was not being able to go to customer sites because customers were locked down like we are, uh, and, uh, and not be able to install and deliver it and turn it on. And obviously the same challenge we had in computing storage with supply chain constraints in capacity because of the social distancing and obviously in the components level that uh, we saw uh, obviously a major disruption. And as a reminder, uh, we ship pretty much three servers every minute. And so when the supply chain stops, uh, it's pretty pretty significant. So in terms of going forward, uh, our priority one, two, and three continues to be clear the backlog. And that's how I, uh, I think about it. Uh, throughout Q2, we made progress uh, in the recovery. I will say China is pretty much back to normal, but obviously they are cleaning the backlog themselves uh, because they had to, you know, first recover the labor, and then obviously they depend also on sub-suppliers for the, the components. Think about cables, connectors, transistors, you name it. And so for us, the majority of the backlog right now is in the bucket, and then in the regional factories, um, you know, for the vast majority, they're all performing at capacity except one or two where, you know, the, the, the rules and the regulations or the shelter in place are demanding that there is a, a, a stringent process on social distancing, which obviously impact the capacity in the factory lines. But the factories are all up and running. So I am uh, optimistic about uh, the weeks to come. So I take this a week at a time. Obviously, uh, we, we continue to focus on the order intake. I cannot comment in May because I think you asked the question of May because we are in Q3 right now. But in Q2, the order area was fairly steady. And, and we expect, you know, not just HPC but computer storage to continue to, to make progress. And that's why Q3 will be different than Q2. Thank you. Our next question okay. comes from Wamzi Mohan with Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, Antonio, you, you commented on right-sizing the cost structure to a new normal. Uh, a few years ago, HPE Next was, was supposed to be the you know, last restructuring program, and I, and I know no one could have anticipated COVID-19. 
But is it your view that you will not get back to pre-COVID levels because of secular end market challenges, or is there a different interpretation to that? Yeah, thank, uh, thanks, uh, Wamsi. Uh, great question. So, uh, since you mentioned uh, HP Next, let me start with that. I, I mean, I was the architect of HP Next uh, in the in the 2017 year. As you know, we launched it in the fall of 2017, and I will say HP Next was a great success story because it allowed us to re-architect the company in the key areas in terms of simplification of processes, streamlining our go-to-market model. Remember, we we went from a worldwide geo to country to more a geo model where we remove layers. And honestly, it allowed us to reinvest back in innovation. And that's where I announced you know, the investment of $4 billion at the edge. And now we start seeing the results of that uh, you know, with uh, great numbers uh, despite the challenges. So that was a success. And remember, we committed to deliver $100 million in net savings, and which we did, and we did ahead of schedule. Now, to your point, this is a crisis unlike anyone we have faced. Um, you know, and I will say, in 2017, I said, listen, we don't envision another cost optimization plan. But this is a cost optimization driven by the pandemic. But honestly, I see uh, an opportunity to go faster in our pivot to our, our strategy, which is to offer everything as a service. It is a very unfortunate that we have this pandemic, which is causing tremendous economic disruption and obviously a huge impact to communities. But from the business perspective, we are more convicted than ever in our strategy, and we see it, you know, the demand for pervasive, ubiquity connectivity, uh, you know, that's why, you know, access points are very strong for us. You know, all cloud, the cloud experience deployed everywhere from the edge to cloud, and the ability to consume it as a service, and this is where we see tremendous momentum with HP Green Lake. So for me, is right size our cost structure, to the new normal, and we don't know exactly what the new normal is at this point in time, um, you know, because we don't know what the recovery looks like. Um, you know, it's about allocating resources for the areas of growth we see in the future, and also increase efficiency because we learn a lot. Remember, in Q1, I talked about it. We learned quite a lot, and we extended the uh, HP Next, uh, which is now part of this uh, cost optimization and prioritization plan, and digitize everything. You know, I believe this will cause incredible structural um, uh, impacts in the way people are going to work. And my expectation is at least 50% of our employees will never come back to an office. And the office will look completely different, which means, you know, our offices will be more center of innovation and collaboration, not where you come to do your regular work every day. And that requires, you know, uh, a resizing our, our real estate footprint but even if you resize the footprint, it also requires new experiences and therefore investment associated with that. But when you bring it all together and they need to reskill and upskill and allocate resources in the right place, uh, I believe we have an opportunity to accelerate that strategy and uh, drive to that long-term sustainable profitable growth. Okay, thanks, Antonio. And the negative operating leverage on compute was, was quite significant in the quarter. How much of that would you say was a supply-driven issue versus demand-driven issue, and, and how do you think investors should think about the trajectory of that, given that you also have these significant cost actions starting to kick in? Thank you. Sure. Uh, definitely was a, a supply uh, chain-driven, although demand uh, continued to be uh, uneven, uh, as we discussed before, uh, particularly in compute. You know, I will say, the, you know, you have to look at it this way. Uh, the, the shortfall on the revenue is pretty much all supply chain driven because I made the comment early on that our linearity in the order intake was pretty steady. But, uh, but in that order linearity, you have to, you know, you have to look at the customer segments. Obviously, when you sell to, um, I call it cloud companies, which are more, uh, software companies that deliver their value through the cloud, those are continue to be steady. Uh, if you think about enterprise, I will say those were pretty steady. Uh, SMB obviously was the biggest challenge, you know, and the transactional business because fundamentally that segment of the market was significantly disrupted. As I think about the future, right, uh, obviously we already were under a micro situation, but, you know, let's remind ourselves that the compute platform go through, um, through an innovation cycle themselves, even though it's commoditized. And as I think about 
the Gen 10, you remember the Gen 10, we actually told uh, everyone that we said that two-thirds of that structural change was permanent because of the ability to attach richer configuration. As we go to what we call Gen 10.5 and Gen 11, uh, which is happening in the next 18 months, you're going to see more than that. You're going to see, uh, again, the same cycle where the density of these products, the, the amount of memory and storage you can put inside this compute platform will continue to increase. And that's uh, good for us because obviously it drives AUP. But right now, our, um, our focus is really around, um, you know, uh, clear the backlog, uh, both on the compute side and on the HPC side, both finished installation and obviously um, clear the backlog there as well. Okay. Our next, next question. question comes from Tony Sakunagi with Bernstein. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I have two questions as well. Uh, first, it, it sounds like you're saying there was really a de minimis impact uh, from coronavirus on demand, and this was largely supply-driven, and if you had the supply – uh, and you kept backlog at normal levels, you would have done 700 million more in revenue in Q2. Um, and it sounds like if production's up and running, if you're able to bring down your backlog to normal levels, that should boost Q3 revenues 700 million relative to normal seasonality. So am I thinking about that correctly? And how much progress do you think you can make on bringing your backlog uh, down to normal levels uh, over the course uh, of Q3? Um, and then I have a follow-up. Yeah, thanks, Tony. Hope all is well. Um, yeah, I think you're thinking in the right parameters. The only thing I will say is that definitely the vast majority was supply chain. And as I said in my early comment uh, in the previous question, there was some demand, obviously, but particularly in SMB and some elements of the mid-market uh, where enterprise was a little more steady. And we saw uptake demand, for example, that consumes compute, uh, for example, in solutions like VDI, which was in high demand, uh, or even big data storage, which at the end, Tony, is a compute is a compute platform with a lot of hard disk attached to it or SSDs attached to it. So in that context, you're asking absolutely the right question, and this is what I'm maniacally focused with the team, and which is a setting on my priority one, two, and three is clear the backlog. And as I said earlier, you know, we focus the quarter in 13 weeks, you know, where we enter the backlog, which was the 1.5 billion on May 1st, and where we're going to exit on July 31st, as the new orders come in, because fundamentally, you know, uh, we expect the orders to come in and that we have a linearity plan associated with that recovery. So uh, I, I feel pretty um, optimistic about it, but however, it's going to come down to our ability to get the supply in the right place uh, and the ability to execute in the cycle times that we need. And obviously, as you know, we have a very global diversified supply chain, and we have made some series of moves to move products built around the globe, even if they are for other regions, so we can accelerate that backlog. And uh, so uh, this is going to be the name of the game, uh, but generally, as I think about the last four weeks and I think about the next four weeks and then the next four weeks after that, we continue to see progress. Um, but, uh, you know, there is a lot of things. Who knows, you know, if there is a restart of coronavirus. I'm more concerned right now, Tony, to be honest with you. If something happened in uh, one of these uh, locations where we have the factory and you go into, you know, a re-sheltering of the social distancing, that could have an impact. In terms of the velocity behind with components from China, I will say that's where the vast majority is going absolutely in the right direction. And obviously the logistics side, as we reopen countries and flights, uh, across the globe, that will help as well. Okay, thank you for that. Um, maybe you could, I, I mean, is it unrealistic to think you could close, you could get backlog to normal levels? And then my my second question is, if, if you're really saying that, you know, this was largely the supply, not demand disruption, I, I'm still a little, um, I'm, I'm, I'm having difficulty reconciling uh, the new 
uh, sort of HPE next to because on your uh, Q4 call, you were pretty unequivocal. There wouldn't be another HPE next. You you felt you were in the right place on cost. You 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 said last quarter you were doing a little bit more on cost, but it wasn't structural. It wasn't another HPE next. And now you're you know you are undertaking a uh, you know significant multi-year structural change and you know a that that doesn't feel consistent with um, with the statement that you know this was really a supply issue um, and b uh, it it makes me wonder like are you more worried about your competitive position or are you worried that the IT environment is going to be weaker for a while? Yeah, thanks, Tony. So my remarks about what happened uh, in, in Q2 was about the supply chain and, and less or so on the demand. I cannot forecast right now what the demand is on the back end, and this is where, you know, in our remarks we said we are looking at the pipeline, we are looking at the economic indicators, which obviously all of you provide um, and, and others, and so I would not make any further comment because on the demand in, I don't know, in October, or November, I don't know what that will look like. Uh, but I'm just replying to your question about what happened in Q2 definitely was based on the order intake we had. It was the vast majority was a supply chain problem. And there were pockets of uneven demand, which obviously were accentuated in the SMB space, which was quite significant. But remember, we serve um, global customers, we serve large enterprise, mid-market, and SMB, and in that, a lot of verticals. So, so you have to look at this from multiple perspectives. But the difference in Q2 was the vast majority was a definitely a supply chain. And in that demand, we saw pockets of growth, you know, despite the dynamic of the coronavirus, which, you know, Aruba definitely was a Despite the 2% decline year over year, we saw bright spots in wireless line up 7%, North America as a geo 12%. The remote access points, we couldn't ship uh, enough of it. I mean, we didn't have all of it. Uh, BDI was another one. So I think uh, that was Q2. As I think about Q3, it's all about cleaning the backlog. And, um, and in a reasonable way, I feel more confident in Q3 and obviously in the results in Q2 because you should expect – continuous improvement. As of, as of the demand, I don't know what to tell you, Tony, right now, because obviously it depends also in the global recovery of the economy, and ultimately customers are going to assess where they want to spend the money, but right now, um, you know, that's where we are. Um, and then in terms of HP Next, I made that comment, um, you know, at the beginning of HP Next. Now, let's be clear, I mean, nobody expected a coronavirus-19 but as I said in one of my comments, I think, to Katie's question, uh, actually, what one, one question was, I believe this is in a downturn, this is where you go double down in your strategy. And this is where, you know, investing in the right place now, so when the recovery takes place, you come out on the other end stronger. And so that's fundamentally what we're doing is really, obviously, addressing the cost resizing for the situation we are in, and in the short term, we have taken some painful action. You know, um, for me as a CEO, telling our employees we're going to cut salaries is not a, an easy thing to do. I don't take that lightly. But on the other hand, you know, allocating the right people, the right resources, the right investment into the future, now that we're in the downturn, is the biggest opportunity. Because I think the strategy is absolutely spot on, and I'm more convicted than ever. Thanks, Tony. Okay, operator, next question. Our next question comes from Shannon Cross with Cross Research. Uh, thank you very much for taking my questions. Um, my first one is, I realize you're not giving guidance, um, but can you provide some parameters for us to consider, um, you know, thinking about OPEX, how much is variable, how material do you think the salary reductions will be relative to sort of the overall um, base run rate of OPEX, and, you know, is there a significant amount of revenue that's sort of just sitting out there waiting to be recognized as soon as customers come back and can be trained and can accept? Um, and, I don't know, maybe something about backlog in terms of your confidence level that you're not going to lose those orders to competitors or, you know, that they're pretty firm orders. Just anything you can kind of give us to 
have some idea of how to think about it. You know, was this the, the trough quarter, for instance? Thank you. Sure. Uh, let me start, and then uh, I will uh, start to talk about more the, the the first part of your question. Obviously, again, uh, it goes back to Tony's question, the confidence to clear the backlog. And this is where, we, again, we are focusing, you know, uh, I feel um, better about it than, you know, six weeks ago. Uh, but as I said earlier, right, we are taking it day by day, week by week. Um, it looks uh, promising, and we continue to make progress every day, every week. Um, in terms of uh, there is, what is the size of revenue, I cannot give you right now, but I will tell you, remember, HPC deals are normally multi-million dollar deals, sometimes uh, mid-double-digit uh, deals, uh, and those are all waiting to be deployed and installed, uh, and they are all over the world. And so, obviously, we have a fantastic uh, services organization uh, ready to go as soon as the customer let us in. So those are the things you need to think about it. Um, but I hope everybody appreciates we've given you a complete direction of what was the backlog and what we're doing about it. I think I'm going to give it back to Tarek to talk about the first part of the question. So, Tarek? Um, thank you, Antonio. It's uh, um, quite difficult to call the bottom or a trough quarter, um, given the level of uncertainty uh, that is currently uh, – um, visible. It's one thing that we know is that the uncertainty is high, and it's everyone's guess what the re shape of the recovery will be. Uh, so please bear that in mind. Um, and, and, and most people and economists who we talk to, and I spend a lot of time talking to many experts, as I'm sure you did, um, are not thinking in terms of a V-shaped recovery, more in terms of a U-shaped recovery. And that's what we are uh, modeling and this is why we have come up with the cost prioritization plan that Antonio mentioned. And as he said, we need to take uh, every day as it comes. So in terms of cost takeout, um, there is, as part of our plan, the goal is to achieve the vast majority of the 800 million net gone rate savings by fiscal year 21, although we said this number will be visible by fiscal year 22. And the reason why we said this is because of this level of uncertainty that exists in the shape of the economic recovery that I was referring to you before. So what we are doing is we're supplementing run rate uh, reductions with temporary uh, pay cuts and actions that we can take otherwise to protect the financial profile of the company and enhance our liquidity moving forward. Back to you, Antonio. Thanks, Tarek. Um, so, uh, next question, please. Our next question comes from Gariel Ong with Deutsche Bank. Uh, thanks. Thanks for uh, thanks for letting me ask the question and and. Um, I guess, I guess first off, I'd like to ask a little about GreenLake. Um, you know, obviously, it was nice that the business still grew um, year on year, but I'm wondering why you're confident in an acceleration in that growth. It seems like as the business gets bigger, it would be hard to sustain the growth rate, but it seems like you're kind of back-ending more of that growth to get the, get to that 30 to 40% compound annual growth rate. Sure. Uh, thank you, Gerald. Uh, you know, I think uh, we have a unique differentiated value proposition with the HP Green Lake and uh, with HP, uh, with the introduction of HP Green Lake Central, which is a true cloud native platform where you can, um, you know, deploy the right mix from H to cloud and consumer as a service and deliver the workload optimized solutions uh, in a standardized way. Um, it, it is a, a true differentiation for us. And uh, what we have seen in the last uh, several months is a continuous uh, growth in our pipeline and the ability to convert that pipeline into larger deals, larger deals. Um, you know, some of these deals, in particular the two or three, which are triple digits, to give a sense. And so for us, and also they are multi-year, right? So for us, um, that's a, an exciting because remember we said many times, when we sign a Green Lake deal, we, we work with a customer in a, in a multi-year deal, and the pull-through for infrastructure, 
that goes with it um, and services attached is higher. Uh, the services attached through Point X, uh, Point X or operational services is 100%, by the way, attached, and the margins are higher. So fundamentally, we are confident in reaffirming the annualized run rate revenue of 30 40% that Tarek talked earlier, uh, because it's a function of getting this continuous momentum and larger deals uh, for many large cap companies. So I think that's what we see. And now we are telling more for the mid market as well for SMB. And what the customers are looking for is the ability to scale up and down based on their needs um, and also uh, more and more have someone else run it for them. They don't want to be in the run side. They want to be more in the innovation side. Got it. Appreciate that. And, and just one, just one more for me. I think I get a sense from the cash spend for for the for the cost realignment that you know fiscal fiscal year 21 is going to be seems like the bulk of the the, the spending. But I, I guess I like to get an idea for whether it's going to be cost of goods sold or opex driven. If there's if it's going to represent the general mix of your costs generally, or if it's going to be weighted one way or another. Thanks. I'm going to give that to Tarek. Yeah, uh, thank you, Antonio. With respect to cash, for cash flow, I am, I'd, I'd like also to ask you a question for clarification purposes. With respect to cash flow, what has driven our cash flow performance in Q2 is the increase in inventory levels and the change in the cash conversion cycle. We've stocked up a lot of inventory, um, and the backlog is also a reflection of the fact that we stocked up a lot of inventory. And our cash flow conversion cycle, which was a favorable minus 17 days, uh, dropped to a less favorable minus five days because of our stocking up in inventory terms. Uh, could you please, uh, for my benefit, repeat your question on cost and what you were trying to get to here? I did not quite understand it. Thank you. Yeah, so, so in terms of your, your, your annualized net run rate savings, uh, what areas of your business are those going to come from? Okay. So, um, by and large, we're, we're going to leave no stone unturned. That's uh, the message. But effectively, if you look at what the, the plan is about, it's fundamentally around realigning resources to the segments that we started to report uh, back in the first quarter and areas of growth that we see, driving better productivity levels across those segments, changing fundamentally the way we engage with customers from a marketing and sales standpoint, rethinking our supply chain to create it in such a way that is more resilient than before, yet agile and efficient, uh, rethinking um, also our workforce management practices because, quite frankly, I don't know what your situation is like, but we've been working very effectively uh, from home for the past three months almost. And so this is pointing uh, to us the need to think about this new normal and what does it mean from a workforce management standpoint and our real estate footprint. So you can... Uh, uh, rethink your real estate footprint now that the world is much more distributed and connected than uh, ever before. So I hope I have uh, provided sufficient color to answer your question. Back to you, Antonio. Yeah, thanks, Tarek. Um, next question. I know we get into the top of the hour um, where we are five minutes over. Um, do we have any more questions on the line, operator? Our next question comes from Aaron Raker with Wells Fargo. Hi, this is okay. Jake on for Aaron. Um, I was wondering if you could go into a little bit about how we should think about portfolio simplification in regard to the cost optimization plan. Yeah, so obviously from the portfolio optimization, I think about, you know, the work we have done under HP Next and, and, and continue that work um, to streamline number of platforms and options. We have done a phenomenal job there. Uh, but to Tarek's point, it's all about where we build these products um, and fundamentally where we also design these products. So there is an opportunity there to continue to drive that uh, optimization. And fundamentally, I think about our portfolio as a way to accelerate that as a service model. 
Obviously, on one end, at the edge, we have uh, a fantastic uh, cloud platform called HP Aruba that uh, we continue to invest, Aruba Central, that we continue to invest uh, and is 100% software, right, with uh, access points and switching that comes with it. And I think that way, and obviously through the subscription model. Um, the other thing is, uh, obviously, on the core business, is how we drive the, uh, the best workload optimized solutions that they are fully automated and provisioned from the cloud using HP GreenLake Central. Uh, so that's another component of that. So that's how we think about it. And, um, and obviously, there is a lot of the work we do even in the core businesses. While people may think it's hardware, um, and I want to give an example, and the recent introduction of our distributed hyperconverged infrastructure is actually all software. It's 100% software in many ways. And as I think about the future, how the world will evolve, we're going to live in a more distributed model. You know, today, uh, you know, it's very centralized in the sense you have your mobile phone or your mobile device connected to some sort of cloud. That cloud can be your data center, can be somebody else's cloud. But fundamentally, the cloud experience will extend, will be extended all the way to the edge. And that's why we have planned in that portfolio to continue to invest um, in the Aruba Central with integration of 5G and the integration of edge computing. So it's a combination of freeing up resources in the traditional businesses, reallocate those resources in those areas that will drive the long-term sustainable profitable growth based on the work we have done uh, um, in HP Next and also continue to digitize everything uh, we, we, we have and, and, and we can. Okay. So next question, please. Our next question comes from Simon Leopold with Raymond James. Thanks for uh, for taking the question. Uh, my sense is is that uh, the, the quarter you just reported was primarily supply, and the uncertainty you're expressing about the outlook maybe reflects uh, more of a shift towards demand. So I thought it would be helpful if you could give us a better understanding of what your customer verticals typically look like. In other words, how much is federal government? How much is the SMB market? How much financial services? Because I think even even if we can't make predictions, I think all of us have some sense of which verticals are healthier than, than others. Appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, uh, Simon. I, I think, um, you know, uh, I will say, let me start with the bad. Uh, SMB obviously has been a significant challenge. Um, we all witness every day. Um, that's what has driven the uh, big chunk of the unemployment um, that we see here in the United States. So obviously um, that will take time to recover, and generally that market gets served through what we call a transactional engine, um, and it's a high-velocity engine. Um, in the enterprise, if you take it by vertical, I think telco has been fairly steady. Uh, Tarek talked about a portfolio that we have called Communication Media Solutions. You, you heard some of the numbers in some areas growing 40 and 70 percent. It's all software and services, um, and obviously drags infrastructure because eventually you have to virtualize whatever infrastructure you put there. Uh, financial service actually was pretty steady and strong. You know, um, we have a very large uh, footprint, and this is where the diversification of our geo and verticals actually is helping us a little bit. Uh, generally, FSI and telco are very um, large for us. Uh, where retail, not so much, and I think retail obviously was more impacted. Um, but I will say uh, telco uh, or communication, media, and entertainment, uh, financial services uh, was strong. Uh, obviously, oil and gas, not so much, <laughs> because we know the, the pricing you know, of the oil. Um, and then uh, as I think about uh, transportation, obviously uh, impacted as well. But I will say the number of deals and the size of the deals were generally uh, the same. The elongated cell cycles was consistent, but we align our plans based on the linearity that I talked earlier, and Q2 was fairly steady um, and so far. So whether you know the first half was supply chain and the second half is demand is to be seen. Again, Tarek talked early on about the shape of the recovery. Uh, and I agree with Alec. I totally subscribe to the EU recovery. The question is how far the two sides of the EU are and how deep the EU is. 
Um, but right now, it, it feels um, it feels steady in those areas, and as I said earlier, our focus is um, the backlog. Okay, next question. I think this is the last uh, one more question. I think this is the last question. Um, I think we have um, an, another question on the line. A final question comes from Amit Daryanani with Evercore ISI. Thanks. Hi, this is Urban Liu dialing in for Amit. Um, as I look at your cost optimization and prioritization plan that was announced today, that will result in a one to one point three billion dollar total cash payment through fiscal 2022. Now, is it fair to say that the cost savings plan will essentially push back the timing uh, related to the achievement of your normalized free cash flow target of $2 billion by, let's say, another two to three years? Yeah, thanks for the question. I'm going to pass it to Tarek. Thank you, Antonio. So, um, the most important thing in our costs optimization and prioritization plan is to achieve those $800 million of net run rate savings and hold them as long as possible in the cost structure so that we can effectively see more margins in our business. Um, you know, with respect to free cash flow last year, if it were not for a uh, legal settlement that we paid, we would have exceeded the $2 billion free cash flow mark. So uh, that was that what that business was capable back then with a certain revenue base. And uh, what you've heard from Antonio is that we are right-sizing the business to what is potentially a new revenue base. And it's too early to tell whether that new revenue base will come back to the pre-pandemic uh, revenue levels uh, moving forward. But what's very important right now is our focus is to ensure that we right-size our business and deliver those run rate savings uh, so that we can emerge stronger after this crisis subsides. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Tarek. And again, I just want to, you know, um, you know, last year was uh, a unique year in the sense that we were pretty much on track. And actually, I will argue we delivered the normalized free cash flow because we were able to take care of um, a unique circumstances with a settlement uh, in arbitration. So when you add it all up, um, it was uh, in excess of $2 billion. And again, it comes down to our ability to drive the, um, the operating cash, the cash from operations, which generally tends to be very strong. Obviously, this quarter, because we couldn't convert, we couldn't deliver that. But let me remind again that the cost optimization and um, is, uh, is a prioritization is not just about resizing, but it's about shifting investments to the strategy, which I answered earlier to Tony. I think it's the opportunity we have now, and therefore, um, making that happen in the lower part of this, whatever the lower is, is the right strategy, uh, so you become stronger on the other end. So to wrap it up, thanks again for joining us today and uh, for your questions. Uh, let me make a few comments to, to wrap the call. You know, as I said earlier, these are unprecedented and challenging times for all of us. It's not just the business, but obviously the economy and the communities. Technology uh, and digital transformation, in my view, are more critical than ever to enable what I think is going to be a new world, a new distributed world where the workforces will be, um, will be located in different ways. And honestly, there will be new ways to run businesses. I think our strategy to deliver a cloud experience from the edge to the cloud is more relevant than ever. And uh, at the core of that is to securely connect people and things, uh, as we see, uh, you know, more than 15 million devices being connected to the network every single day. But at the same time, we need to analyze data faster and to accelerate business outcomes for our customers. I think the measure we announced today uh, will allow us to protect not only our balance sheet and continue to preserve the liquidity, which, as you saw uh, in one of the slides, uh, we have a very robust balance sheet uh, with capacity up to $10 billion, so that's not the issue. But fundamentally, my goal is to adapt the organization to be more agile, to align our resources to the critical core business areas of growth, and ultimately to accelerate the strategy, which I'm very convicted 
which will result in a long-term sustainable profitable growth. And uh, I want you to take uh, away that this work is being done with sense of urgency. Um, whether we are the first to announce it and other people, doesn't matter. We believe that um, this is the right thing to do and the time is important. So again, thank you for joining us uh, the call today and I hope to you stay safe with you and your family and uh, we'll talk um, soon. Take care. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our call for today and you may now disconnect. Thank you.